So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our part two lecture. That's absurd. Uh, Jacques Maritain, an early 20th century avant-garde art. Uh, my name is Godrma, and uh, on behalf of St. Luke's Club, I want to thank each of you for tuning in today. So the lectures have been organized by St. Luke's Club, which is a community of religious artists uh, uniting Vilnius Academy of Arts and Lithuanian Academy of uh, Music and Theatre students. And of course, these lectures wouldn't have been, wouldn't have taken place without the support from Vilnius Academy of Arts, which we are very grateful to them for. As yesterday, uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen Garrett, who recently thought as an associate professor of philosophy and religion at the Vilnius Academy of Arts. He now serves as a curriculum vice president for Global Scholars, where he leads an international team of 46 academics from 27 countries to develop resources and curriculum that equip, empower, and encourage Christian academics to bring their Christian faith to bear organically into their teaching, research, and administration. administration. On the part one lecture yesterday, Professor introduced us to a French philosopher Jacques Maritain and his approach to art as a habitus of the practical intellect and as the undeviating determination of work to be done. During the lecture uh, and the heated discussion afterwards, we delved into the definition of Christian art, the pursuit um, and meaning of beauty, uh, the challenge of being a Christian artist in the context of modern romanticized approach and so on. Today, we will continue going even further into these kinds of topics, exploring some of the theological and philosophical underpinnings of Dada movement. The lecture will take place for up to 40 minutes, after which we will have an open discussion, um, which I encourage everyone to join in. And please write down your questions, which may arise during the lecture. You will be able to ask them yourself during the discussion time. Um, yeah, or write them in the chat. So that's it for me. Thank you for your patience. And now I hand over the word to the professor. So thank you again for having me and inviting me to uh, give this talk. Uh, definitely great conversation yesterday. Uh, and so uh, today we're going to look a little bit more uh, at uh, um, the early 20th century avant-garde movement Dada in pr its particular um, uh, instantiation or its, its uh, um, uh, beginnings there in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And I, I want you to keep in mind um, if uh, some of the, the conversations from yesterday uh, uh, with regards to uh, Maritain's understanding of what Christian art, uh, what his understanding of art, and then subsequently Christian art. Um, and of course, we all may differ on, on what that may mean exactly, and perhaps you have other uh, thinkers that might inform your understanding of that, of Christian art. Uh, but when we get to Dada uh, here, it, uh, it will be uh, good for us to then engage with uh, um, data in a way that uh, perhaps maybe is different than what you've read in art history. Uh, this is the typical narrative of, of what uh, data is often explained to be. So um, at least that's my hope, uh, is that maybe we'll see data a little bit differently, um, though for sure it still remains to be quite an absurd movement. Uh, so uh, let's take a look. Going to share my screen. So, so I presume everybody can see. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's move this here over here. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, we'll be looking at um, the early 20th century avant-garde. Um, art, uh, particularly um, data, and with the subtitle uh, of my uh, uh, talk today, um, can anything good come out of data in Zurich? 
So when we think about data, we need to make sure that we understand some of the early 20th century context. Uh, and this is uh, often difficult when we do historical studies, um, is that we are moderns uh, living in the 21st century and trying to, to transport ourselves back into to different time periods and contexts. Uh, we just always have to remember that we don't fully have an understanding of what that uh, uh, context uh, was, but yet it doesn't mean that we can't know something about it. And so I, it's where I begin today is just reminding us of uh, some of the things that were taking place during the early uh, 20th century. Of course, you know, it was characterized by upheaval, uh, things like uh, World War I, 1914 to 1918, you know, we learned yesterday to, uh, or that we'll you'll you'll hear more about today when when uh, the Dada movement began in Zurich in 1916. But you remember, um, Maritain's uh, work was uh, Art and Scholasticism was written in 1920. So you can see these are the the things that are happening. Russian Revolution, uh, you know, occurring 1917, 1923. But you also had uh, things that were inspiring people, uh, discoveries uh, from uh, with Freud and Einstein, as well as technological innovations, uh, a number of uh, scientific advancements, all that were happening, you know, at the same time. So there was a, a modern sensibility, if you will, that had a sense of exuberance and excitement of progress, uh, and yet at the same time. In, in, in many parts of the world, particularly on the continent there uh, in Europe, is just utter devastation, uh, just impending doom. Um, it, it was uh, disastrous. Uh, and so, and it's, it's the latter part that uh, is really the context for Dada, uh, as many of the uh, um, beginners of the movement there in Zurich were expats uh, coming from, from places that were uh, facing uh, World War One, uh, Artistically speaking, uh, you are also likely familiar with the Futurist mo movement, uh, paintings like you see here, uh, whether uh, it was also the construction, uh, a constructivist movement, you know, uh, there was belief that, you know, modern art um, needed a transition, it needed a new ethos that was uh, linking its art to the, the things that were going on around them. Um, and so I think both of these movements sh uh, sort of show how the futurist movement in, uh, in that this progress and it's exciting, what could the, the future possibly be? And yet in the constructivist movement, you know, here this uh, um, uh, tower is, uh, in, you know, a uh, homage to uh, the Russian revolution was supposed to, uh, rival the Eiffel Tower, though it was never actually built. Um, and so it's it's this sort of uh, uh, ethos or the milieu in which the Dada movement uh, began in Zurich. So Dada was born uh, on uh, the 5th of February, 1916. Hugo Ball is uh, a German expat, and he opened up uh, a place called the Cabaret Voltaire uh, there in Zurich, as I mentioned, uh, you can see uh, a black and white um, photo of some of its earliest beginnings. <laughs> Ball had advertised his openings as a group. Um, this quote comes from, and all the quotes that I'll share with you today from Ball come from his um, uh, uh, diaries, uh, which is uh, entitled Flight Out of Time. Uh, if you have a chance to, to get a copy of that book, it's, you know, it's just fascinating. Uh, because it really gives insight into uh, some of the the early beginnings of uh, um, of Dada, and I think you'll you'll also see why I think the way in which it's been received, um, while antagonistic and uh, oftentimes um, characterized as nihilistic, is is I think there's more going on there philosophically, especially theologically, that I hope you'll see. So be that as it may. Uh, he advertised uh, the opening as a group of young artists and writers whose aims to create a center for artistic entertainment. It was an artistic space with daily readings and performances. Uh, he says, um, on why Voltaire, the ideals of culture and of art as a program for a variety show. 
That's our candide against the times. And so in this uh, short quote, it's important to, if you don't know Voltaire's work, Candide, it is uh, to which he refers, it was Voltaire's uh, magnum opus, it was his seminal work. Uh, and it parodies a lot of adventures, uh, romance cliches and struggles um, of which were, you know, had a, a caricature and a tone that was bitter uh, and very matter of fact. In fact, this particular, you know, Candide was uh, very provocative for its day uh, and was not well received um, at all. Philosophers, though, um, of the day, you know, were also struggling with the problem of evil. Much of what was going on there with the, the Russian Revolution and World War I, uh, and Candide was a short theological novel, uh, albeit it was, uh, um, it had, had uh, you know, bits of humor uh, also sprinkled throughout. But Voltaire, uh, and this is partly why I think many people uh, didn't uh, receive it, was that he ridicules religion, he ridicules theologians, he ridicules the government, the army. I mean, he just takes on everybody, um, though he does it in a very subtle way, and he does it through um, the form of a novel. And so this, you know, plays to some extent into our conversation yesterday, where we were talking about uh, um, indirect um, uh, the way in which metaphor functions. Uh, and in, in many ways, this is the way that art can function. It's not always an explicit uh, um, uh, explanation or a, a, a depiction, or it, it often comes in, as, the, as we say, uh, in the side door. It comes uh, indirectly. And this is what Candide um, uh, did. And, and also why I think it's important to understand that connection, because Bao saw this as what uh, the Dada movement was all about. So Ball uh, was joined by other expats. Uh, Amy Hennings uh, at the time was his girlfriend who would, who would be his future wife, Hans Arp, Sophia Talbert, Tristan Zara, and you can see the list there as well. Uh, important to note, uh, uh, Hans Richter as well and, 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 and Viking Egling all had uh, a part to play in the beginnings of Dada there in Zurich. Meetings were very transgressive, they were offensive, they made no sense, they had concerts that were played on typewriters, they were playing kettle drums, they played on pianos that were out of tune. And so people, you know, who attended some of these meetings um, were just baffled by, by what was taking place. Many of the poems, of course, were read in German, French, and Russian. Um, that was not by coincidence. Uh, of course, these were uh, the major players on the continent that were taking place with World War I, uh, the Russian Revolution. And so um, this was intentional uh, on the part uh, of those there uh, in Zurich. This is a, a famous, um, you know, portrait, uh, you know, a photo. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this when you Google data. Uh, this is one of the, the ones of, uh, you know, the Google uh, bow that comes up. It's been subsequently titled the magic bishop uh, and so uh, it's uh, more common you know to have performances that were occurred uh, there during the cabaret voltaire meetings were what were called simultaneous poems it's where three or more people would would begin to read <clears throat> and sometimes they would sing or they would whistle uh, different parts of a different tune uh, but th these were quite popular uh, in their meetings. They recited all kinds of different things from poetry, uh, what they considered high poetry, uh, from pop songs, boring news articles that they thought were banal, uh, nonsensical sentences. Uh, and yet they had these, uh, what they called and described as inorganic uh, sorts of sounds where they were sirens, crashes, drums, uh, um, things that just didn't seem to make sense um, or, or even uh, um, seem to go together or fit in any sort of harmony. And so, of course, as you might imagine, uh, these simultaneous poems were abrasive, they were jolting, right? it was just a big cacophony, a whole bunch of noise, um, at least that's the way they were at, at times perceived. 
And so I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard that. I'm, I'm going to try some be a little bit tech savvy here. I'm not very tech savvy, but I'm going to try. So I have um, the sound of one of these, uh, the beginnings of what was called uh, in And in this was um, this photo that you see here. It's uh, just going to play about a minute, maybe or so, a minute and a half of the beginnings of um, this sound poem that uh, Val had read during one of the Cabaret Voltaire meetings. So it actually occurred on the 23rd of June, 1916, so. Well, hopefully uh, that gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, what um, what a sound poetry uh, was all about, or sound when they when they read it. It's uh, obviously this is a reproduction. Uh, this is something that was done later, but it uh, I think does kind of give uh, a good idea. In fact, uh, Hugo Ball and his diaries uh, reflected back on this experience, um, and you know he he talked um, a little bit about it, uh, and we'll look at it a little bit differently um, as we get a little bit later on and see his uh, interpretation, you know of um you know that particular uh experience so hugo bell you know felt that uh, this was the underlying purpose of what simultaneous poetry was all about he said the simultaneous poem has to do with the value of the voice the human organ represents the soul the individuality in its wanderings with its demonic companions the noises represent the material, cultural, and spiritual background. The inarticulate, the uh, disastrous, the decisive. The poem tries to elucidate the fact that man is swallowed up in the mechanic process, mechanistic process. In a typically compressed way, it shows the conflict of the vox uh, humana with a world that threatens, ensnares, destroys it a world whose rhythm and noise are ineluctable. So I think you can, can pick up, uh, if you read the quote carefully, you'll see that uh, the point of some of the, the simultaneous poetry and the poems that were read was to draw attention to the cacophony that was going on around them uh, in, in how the human voice is often drowned out um, as a result uh, of all that was going on. And yet at the same time, especially at the very beginning, he had great respect, so it seems, uh, for the human voice itself. 
in what it uh, represents, um, in how it's a, a, an entry into the soul, its individuality, uh, and yet its capacity to do um, evil things. So continuing um, the, dis uh, you know, the discussion or the, the presentation here with the birth of Dada, what we see uh, is Ball's remarks uh, in that quote reveal very common themes that Dada was about uh, in Zurich. The human beings are vulnerable, they're threatened uh, um, by what's happening, and Dada was protesting against this sort of cold and mechanistic, you know, modern world. It's radical, unconventional philosophy of art that demeans the aesthetic quality, craftsmanship, and professionalism. And you might recall from yesterday, our emphasis that Maritain uh, had placed um, on art was the actual aesthetic quality, the object itself on craftsmanship is particularly for his broad understanding of art. Uh, and when he linked it to, to, to beauty, you know, he found the subset uh, of art to be fine art. And he believed that, you know, the artist should only be, you know, concern themselves with doing um, the work well. This seems to be in contradiction to, to what Maritain was saying yesterday. And so this is the stated intent um, that Baal and those at the Cabaret Voltaire about what they were trying to do. Uh, they had tried to shift uh, what was called the interpretive center of gravity from the aesthetics of the object to the critical sociocultural consciousness implied in the artist activity. And so you remember in our conversations yesterday where uh, um, as uh, 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 Godrema had said, art is uh, um, uh, a habitus of practical intellect. It seems to me what they are uh, shifting the focus uh, from what uh, Maritain had said about it focus on the object and creating and making something um, um, uh, well done, that they're focusing in on that habitus. What's that environment of which uh, um, the artist lives and breathes and moves? So it's here that I kind of see there's a potential connection with Maritain, um, though it seems that as this quote uh, or, or this point here is that there's a shift from object to the habitus. And if you see in this, in this painting here, it's called Inside Outside uh, from George uh, Gross. It's quite an interesting um, take, right? You see all the poverty, uh, um, the difficulty um, it, on the outside, and yet on the inside, people living like kings. Uh, uh, in Queens. And so it's, a, again, criticism of culture, criticism of the society and the inability uh, um, to take care of the least uh, among them. So again, continuing uh, on, we see that uh, Dada, you know, began, as you seems quite obvious on the surface, when you hear, you know, uh, um, you know, loud that it's quite absurd, quite um, uh, a mess, just an utter mess. What can we make of any of this? Well, Ball saw this sort of uh, uh, um, absurdity of the industrialized warfare uh, that had uh, come onto the scene through World War I, and he wanted to stand up uh, against the agony and the death throes of the age, he says. So he did that by creating nonsensical art uh, because it's through this nonsensical that he believed that it would somehow find a way to purge and purify um, the language. So again, a quote from one of his diary entries on the 14th of April, 1916, he says, our cabaret is a gesture. Every word that's spoken and sung here says at least this one thing, that this humiliating age has not succeeded in winning our respect. Our spontaneous foolishness and our enthusiasm for illusion will destroy them. So Hans Erp, uh, you know, in his own description of what the cabaret was all about, uh, seems to wear the badge of nihilist 
uh, as a badge of honor and says, our replies are sighs of love, volleys of hiccups, poems, moos and meowing of medieval brutists. We were given the honorary title of nihilist. So there isn't any real question that, you know, art historians, uh, you know, even by some of the self descriptions uh, of those at the Cabaret Voltaire, uh, you know, about being nihilist, that, that it seems to be that if you look at it um, in, in one, on the one hand, it can seem very much like that. Even you see this particular work here by a houseman, uh, Mechanical Head, The Spirit of Our Age, 1920. What is this? Again, um, it's a, a focus on a social political critique. Uh, what does it mean to be human? Um, how does the mechanistic age uh, characterize uh, and answer that question? Uh, and so I think, um, again, focus is shifting to the habitus uh, if we're you know, talking in Maritain's terms. And yet Ball seems to assert something a bit different. Ball said that uh, what we call data is a farce of nothingness in which all higher questions are involved. So Ball surmised that this tumultuous period of time was uh, manifesting nihilism, but he believed that the nihilism that was present was far deeper and more death-driven. The things that were happening on the continent with World War I and Russian Revolution, he said this was far more nihilistic than these simultaneous poems that they were reading at the Cabaret uh, Voltaire. You know, and it's in this sense that you know, he recognized that the Dada movement you know, was weak to affect any sense of the war's outcome at all. Uh, in fact, you know, demonstrating that Dada was not only a form of protest, but it was actually a lament. It was uh, a point at which uh, um, that of great sorrow. Here's another entry from his diaries on the 5th of October, 1915, uh, when he says, mountains are being displaced and cities lifted up in the air. So why shouldn't the plaster around human hearts get splits and cracks in it? And so even in that uh, uh, entry, he's noting just the, the other devastation, uh, the destruction that's occurring, mountains being displaced, cities lifted up in the air, and yet this should break our hearts and all the things, in our hearts that have been encased um, you know, with the mechanisms of the early 20th century. Of course, they should have cracks and splits. So if Dot is a farce of nothingness, as Ball has said, what is Dada? Uh, again, um, Ball's diary entry on the 12th of March provides another bit of a clue for us. What we're celebrating is both buffoonery and a requiem mass. So this entry signals, you know, really that maybe there's a bit more going on at the Cabaret Voltaire than we realize. Maybe it's a bit more than what art historians um, have uh, indicated um, as uh, uh, simply uh, a nihilistic uh, endeavor, or as uh, um, many have tried to tell the story, it's again, anti-art and throwing off the shackles of authority. Uh, and this continues the trend of avant-garde art of the 19th century. One of the commentators on Dada, uh, Erdmut White has suggests um, that the absurdity that was coming from Cabaret Voltaire shouldn't disguise the intense spiritual longing that informs all of Bao's life uh, and work. So really on the contrary to what many art critics, you know, are suggesting about Dada and Zurich and with all of its foolishness and seemingly incoherence, the Cabaret Voltaire has surprisingly incorporated a number of religious symbolisms as well as references uh, into their various performances. So if we go back to the magic bishop uh, and we take a little bit closer look at uh, Lautgedichte, the sound poem uh, from Val, I think we will see uh, that it's a carefully constructed sequence of poems. There's three of them that's read if you were to, to put them all out uh, together. Three of these poems that are read 
And though it's unrecognizable in the words, as we heard earlier, the poems uh, did have form in the sense that it may not have uh, uh, anything recognizable, but the sounds that were associated, they were designed to connect the subject uh, matter with the various titles of these poems. So this, you know, might seem somewhat blasphemous and on the surface and Ball's diaries, you know, suggest that this sort of magical bishop had encountered his Catholic childhood. And he's reframing this sound poetry perhaps actually as a kind of prayer, a prayer of lament, just as if he were a priest that presiding over the requiem-like mass. Requiem-like mass, for those who might not know, it's the, uh, a point of which uh, um, uh, about uh, funeral uh, and death, um, it's filled with great lament and sorrow. And so Bile in his diary entry on the 23rd of June says this as he reflected back on one of his public performances. He says, then I noticed that my voice had no choice but to take on an ancient cadence of priestly lamentation, that style of liturgical singing that wails in all the Catholic churches of East and West. Then the lights went out as I had ordered and I was carried off the stage like a magical bishop. Another uh, phrase, uh, if we look uh, at the words closely, the beginnings of one of them, an art historian, John Elderfield, uh, who's actually the one who edited um, Flight Out of Time or Bow's Diaries, had, uh, had, had acknowledged that there was a parallel here uh, to Jesus's own words. So at the very beginning of the first poem, um, the words there, I, I have them on the screen, uh, Elomen, Elomen, Leftolamani. Well, he thinks that they're somewhat parallel to Jesus's own words on the cross uh, when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there seems to be that same sort of incantation rhythm um, that, that was uh, a parallel to those words, uh, according to Elderfield. So when we look, you know, a little bit closer, you know, to this public performance um, that Bao did, he said, he even told the audience, uh, and he said, I shall be reading poems that are meant to dispense with conventional language. So this clearly acknowledges that they knew what they were doing. You know, they, they were, this was quite intentional. And so uh, he was uh, convinced that these poems, you know, have the potential to cleanse this accursed language of all the filth that clings to it as to the hands of stockbrokers worn smooth by coins. So by creating this nonsensical language, by uh, doing things that were seemingly blasphemous or uh, um, nonsensical, Bao at least believed that this was a way in which to try to shed all of the sort of things that they saw in the, in the culture and the society around them, whether it be through the, the news or, or government officials, and even you know, from um, the church itself. So in these phonetic poems, uh, Bao goes on to say, we totally renounce the language that journalism has abused and corrupted. We must return to the innermost alchemy of the word. We must even give up the word too, to keep for poetry its last and holiest refuge. So it's clear here that Bao believes in the power of the living spoken word. He saw a deep connection, you know, here between how society uh, viewed language and the ethical treatment of others. And the connection you see even in that last uh, quotation there about how he wanted to denounce the language that was the journalists were writing and saying. Uh, and of course, he's making this connection that this was indicative of how people even viewed language. Did they believe that language could uh, um, say something meaningful or true? And if you denied this, or if it was propaganda or misinformation, then he was looking at the broader culture and society and saying, look, look at how we treat our fellow human beings. And he was linking it back to how we even perceive of language uh, itself. 
So in another diary entry on the 13th of August, he said, as respect for language increases, the disrespect for the human image will decrease. It's with language that purification must begin and the imagination purified. So clearly he has a high regard for human language and he sees it uh, directly connected to the dignity of human beings themselves. So can anything good come out of the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich? I hope that um, by some of these diary entries and understanding a little bit more from at least Bao's perspective, you're starting to get a bit of a clue as to where I might be going um, with uh, answering this question. You also might remember from yesterday this particular uh, um, sketch here by St. Hildegard. Uh, and it, uh, it comes from um, a, a book called uh, Skivala, and it was these sketches of her 26 visions that she had um, back around 1151-52. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, Baal uh, um, drew upon Hildegard, uh, Hildegard's uh, work, uh, and he was very much aware uh, of her. And interestingly, uh, there were many parts of her own writings that were indecipherable. She had words and lengthy uh, um, entries that were uh, constructed as if they were prayer and sacred speech, but they didn't seem to make any sense either. And other commentators uh, um, and art historians have, have found this interesting and in how they have paralleled you know, you know, all Bao's own sound poems. So at the end of the last quote, you saw, you know, holy refuge. And it's here that Baal seems to rediscover this sort of astonishing insight into the connection that language is actually intelligible. How can it be intelligible at all with all of the nonsense that's happening in culture and society? Uh, well, because he believed that language was intelligible, it uh, uh, opened the world back up for him, uh, and it was a re-enchantment, if you will, uh, that led him further and further into Christian mysticism. And he actually wrote a book on Christian mysticism, and I think it was in 1923. And that was the title, actually, uh, if, if my memory serves me uh, correctly. So Bao believed his sound poetry was so, and this a quote for him, was so loaded um, the word with strength and energies that helped to rediscover the evangelical concept of the word logos as a magical complex image. And here he's referring to the gospel of John uh, and he's referring to in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the logos. Uh, and so Bao believed that the sound poetry um, that they created there at the Cabaret Voltaire was in an, in an effort uh, to try to purify language, this logos, in order that they can renew this dignity of human beings who were made in the image uh, of God. So that's one thing I think that we see that can good that's coming out of the Cabaret Voltaire is Bao's emphasis on the connection of language and human dignity. And of course, how he roots it in the incarnation, in the word, uh, um, uh, in the logos, in Jesus Christ himself. Another uh, thing that I, that I think that uh, in terms of what's good that can come out of the Cabaret Voltaire that uh, seemingly may be characterized as absurd, Ball and his mates had levied some serious protests against the atrocities there at World War I and against this underlying destructive advances that were occurring, um, industrialized warfare and abusive cultural powers and all these things. But if you look closely at this particular um, uh, piece of work done by John Hartfield, uh, a German there in, in Berlin, uh, where the Dada movement um, had also emerged. You know, the title there says, Down with Art, Down with the Bourgeois Mentality, there at the bottom. But Dada is great. Uh, and then in the, in the bottom part, it says, John Hartfield, uh, translation there is its prophet. So I wonder just how prophetic the Dada movement might be. 
and if we might be able to draw any parallels to the biblical prophets, some of you might be familiar with some of the uh, uh, Hebrew scriptures, uh, uh, prophets like Jeremiah, Amos, and Jonah. If you go read the little book of Amos in the Old Testament there in the Hebrew scriptures, you'll see that Amos was fed up with the people uh, at the time, the Israelites. In fact, uh, he was, there's one part in there uh, where he's telling them that if they don't uh, um, stop being so consumed with their wealth uh, and stop uh, uh, to help and take care of the poor, that uh, Assyria is coming to take them away in large, with large hooks, uh, meaning that uh, in, in pretty graphic way, uh, taking their bodies with large hooks and, and taking them uh, into exile. Jeremiah also is quite interesting because he's uh, prophesying to the people of Israel, having similar kinds of harsh message messages, but he's doing some doing so in pretty absurd ways. In fact, on one point, he's on the ground rolling around on top of a brick, uh, and you know another point uh, at which that just seems so absurd at the time. So it's just something. As I think through some of the uh, of what was happening, it seems to me that uh, uh, there there very well could be some parallels there um, between the two. So, with you know an artist's ability to see what others don't see, it seems to be that artists perhaps maybe can be prophets as well. They're able to foretell. In other words, they see things that perhaps others don't, uh, perhaps coming into the near future, but they also foretell. In other words, that they proclaim, they say things that need to be said that are difficult and hard to be said. And maybe they do so in ways that um, might just be absurd. So I do think there's some good there um, in that respect. Before we come to the end here, I want to just point out to you that uh, what I, you know, calls international uprising. So you don't think that if you're not familiar with the Dada movement, it's not just, you know, it started in Zurich, but it also found its way into Berlin with Hannah Hook and some of her uh, montages. Now, this one particularly uh, entitled Cut with the Kitchen Knife through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epic in Germany. It also was in Francis uh, Picavia uh, in some of his uh, works uh, as well. Men always need a God, a God to defend them from other men. That's the, the uh, sketch on the left. The sketch on the right there is the essence of man is found in his faults. And then, of course, I think uh, many of you know who this is. New York City is Marcel Duchamp, though he's French. He brought the Dada movement to New York City. And famously, of course, known with his ready mades uh, challenging, you know, just what is art itself, and particularly institutional art, who decides what is art. So can anything good come out of Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich? Well, Zurich data, I think, is influenced uh, by and borrowed uh, from, you know, Christianity's rich tradition, particularly its various liturgical forms. And in fact, Ball, uh, in that sound poetry, Laut Gedichte, you know, he found himself reflecting back and that uh, he was saying it almost in, in sort of a chant like uh, where he was recalling aspects, as I mentioned, of his own Catholic upbringing. Of course, uh, the non traditional uses of the tradition were interrupted as or interpreted as uh, uh, antagonistic and demeaning to the church. And of course, these performances are in no way straightforwardly Christian. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this was why uh, the Dada movement was, was received in, in many respects you know, as, as heretical. So despite some of these uh, heterodox uh, um, things and unorthodox things that were, were done and said, I think they really explored their religious doubts. They explored theological questions under very oppressive circumstances. And I think they can give us a bit of hope uh, because uh, perhaps there's some beauty that can be found even in and through the absurd. I mean, after all, you know, the God of the universe became a human being. 
in Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose from the dead by the power of the Spirit to give and bring us life. How absurd is that? Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, it starts to connect some of the dots from yesterday, and perhaps maybe we can explore some of those relationships um, as well, or you know, other questions you might have about that. Thank you very much for the lecture. So right now we may proceed to the discussion and the questions. So does anyone have a question you can ask? Maybe just to connect with yesterday's lesson uh, lecture. Um, uh, did Jacques Maritain um, talk about Dada movement? Um, what was his uh, uh, thoughts about it? Yeah, no, he didn't. I mean, from what I can can uh, have read, I've all and, and I'm not a, a maritime expert, but I've only read the things that he's uh, written on the philosophy of art. And so within those writings and works, um, he he doesn't mention the Dada movement, interestingly. But what is fascinating is that, uh, you know, from some of the, the things that he said, you might remember uh, uh, some of the things were said about his view of cubism. Uh, and in fact, you know, he doesn't have uh, much love for for these modern movements at all. In fact, uh, I think he idealizes the medieval period uh, in such a way that he thinks this is sort of the prime uh, for Christian art. And yet, at the same time, in one of the quotes we read yesterday, his view on Cubism was one at which he thought that there's value in Cubism because of what it was uh, uh, helping us to understand is that what we see in front of us is not real. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, you're, you, you probably know Majrit's, uh, you know, famous, um, you know, well-known painting of a pipe, right? And, and underneath it, uh, it says, this is not a pipe, right? And so, you know, Majrit's saying, look, this is not reality. And I think this is what uh, Maritain finds valuable um, about uh, these early 20th centuries avant-garde movements is that we have to keep in mind that this isn't real. This not, it's not reality. And this helps Mar Maritain because what does he think is real? Um, you know, he, he gets back to those things that are real because he wants to tie them to those things that are true, those things that are good, those things that are beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I think he would answer that question. I think that's how he would view these early avant-garde movements. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question, Madhavan. Um, if anyone has a question, you may ask. I maybe just wanted to share my thoughts um, because uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting that uh, immediately for me, the movement um, and its stance and its um, strategy and of course circumstances uh, resonated with today with, for me. Um, it's very modern. I think the approach is totally modern. Even today it would be, you know, the same strange. It would be people wouldn't, yeah would have to dig deeper and that's why i think it's um, it's amazing because it is the only way you have to dig deeper in order to understand it and um, and not only dig deeper into the not the art itself but um in into faith and as you mentioned that they express their um, doubts in, in, in maybe in in religion and in faith which is very human and very, I think it's it's very important. So yeah, it's it's amazing. It's very astonishing to me. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, getting ready for these uh, presentations, these discussions, and then of course, just uh, own explorations. Didn't know 
obviously what was going to happen and start back in February. Um, and, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, Russia invasions of Ukraine, uh, the death and the destruction that we see taking place uh, in Mariupol, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, in recognizing that Maritime's wife and her family comes from Mariupol. Um, I mean, just these sort of connections, you know, became very alive. And of course, I think that's what makes some of what we even see here with the data movement even more real for us. Um, and to understand that as artists, you have a significant role to play. Um, and, and while I think Maritime is is right on the one hand to help us to, uh, um, as Christian artists to focus in on doing good work. Don't try to create something beautiful. Don't try to, uh, you know, uh, separate your Christian life from your your art uh, from the artist within you. Um, he says these are all together. I think all these things are are are, are well said, but I think what Dada helped you know me see is that. You know, think about what was happening to Baal, right? So I, I should mention too, he converted to Catholicism uh, in 1920-21, um, somewhere in this this period too. In fact, it was uh, um, interesting to see where he was drawing upon Christian mystics like Hildegard, uh, and this was coming out in his own work. So again, you see the habitus, this environment, the milieu, the disposition, what's happening of uh, uh, Baal himself is coming out in his artwork and he's not even really trying to think, well, how can I make this Christian? No, 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 no. He's trying to make art in a way that speaks to the, his day, to his time. And yet at the same time, he's leaning into these theological questions, these philosophical questions. He's leaning into, uh, uh, you know, the tradition. Um, and so I, I, I think it's, yeah, uh, very relevant for us uh, to think about um, and process. It doesn't, and, and understandably so, also relating back to the question from yesterday, the reception, the church sometimes doesn't receive this and why artists sometimes find uh, a very difficult place in life within the life of the church. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, understandable. Um, and uh, do you think that um, we should always strive to um, speak to, through our works, speak to this day and this time? I mean, is it the only, um, is it the only art that's worth, that has worth, or? Good question. Um, I wouldn't want to prescribe that. Um, I think every artist is uniquely made. Um, every artist has a unique vocation calling, if you will, uh, you know, a unique way of seeing. As I said yesterday, this idea of habitus is not about method. If it was about method, then it could be reproduced and it would be closer to, you know, the empirical method of, of science, which is valuable. They're doing science it has its own domain and does great things in helping us understand the world, but not like artists do. And what in an, when, an, when an artist makes uh, a, a work of art, it's not reproducible. <laughs> and so uh, as a result, uh, if I were to prescribe, maybe there's a time at which the artist from the, or your own experience, your own place, location, culture, education, family, uh, uh, participation in, in ecclesial life, all these things shape you in a way that then leads to production of art uh, and that's valuable that's valuable so it may speak to society in one way um, at one time how many of, of the likes of folks like van gogh or those who weren't even well known until way after they had gone and uh, they had died so who's to say but that and i agree with maritan here i don't think that should be our focus our focus is not what uh, what is it that's you know are you passionate about what is it that you see um, lean into learning how to work with the materiality that you are passionate about working with or try new things explore new things um, yeah.
That's really, really good advice for young artists. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's words of wisdom. <laughs> well, not, to be, not being an artist, this is the wisdom that's been shared with me from other artists <laughs> whom I've interacted with through, you know, the last couple of decades, so. Uh, we have one question uh, that Manta wrote it, but um, she asked me to read it. Like, so uh, she has a question: If um, Dada movement, um, if it has so many similarities with Christianity, maybe it could uh, help um, to renew uh, the contemporary church nowadays. Uh, maybe you have any any ideas about it? Yeah, so I we'll want to be careful uh, when we think about Dada uh, to say it's a Christian movement. I wouldn't say it that um, because it's clearly in other places, it, you know, um, and, and it does have absurdities and connections with those things that are uh, nihilistic. So I wouldn't say it that way. Uh, but I would just, you know, uh, it's on the surface, it doesn't necessarily appear to be, it, it, you know, may not have these Christian impulses, but when you dig deeper and you look and explore, then you can see that it does. And yet, it's also on the flip side, you know, uh, this, you know, similar things. So I think um, with regards to the contemporary church, it's important uh, to understand that, um, you know, as I said earlier, trying to make art in a way uh, um, uh, that perhaps connects to our surrounding culture, helping the church understand this, uh, perhaps exposing things within the church uh, and the assumptions uh, um, that they make um, that may not be consistent with the tradition or with scripture. Uh, I mean, I, I can speak to the American church, uh, you know, having grown up in it. And then, of course, um, and it's very diverse and eclectic, you know, so it's not as if it's only one. So I wouldn't want to say, you know, for all of these things. But generally speaking, there is, you know, connections that are often wrapped up in a very individualistic notion of the human person. It's also very individualistic in its understanding of freedom, uh, meaning that it's only about the choice. This is what's important. Uh, and so uh, if you have the ability you know, to choose, then this is we should respect these things. And so, you know, I've been in trouble a bit a time or two myself with some of these questions and um, asking that if that's really our highest priority, when we think about freedom and liberty as uh, only about choosing, it seems to me that if we think about freedom tying to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, I've come to set you free. Well, it has to do with that relationship. And if that's the case, it seems to me that it, I may have the freedom uh, um, uh, to choose things, but those choices should be such that it helps those who are the least among us. Uh, so uh, a quick example, uh, it's more political. I don't know how political it got in Lithuania with these whole things with mass and COVID. So it just baffled me why people in some of the churches in my area were making this such a political thing and said, oh, it's your choice. You can wear it or not. We should respect what other people say and do, blah, blah, blah. To me, that's the minimum standard. <laughs> That's just minimum to, to live with one another. As Christians, I was trying to make the argument with many local uh, uh, leaders that we have people in our congregations who are compromised, immune compromised. We have people who are struggling with this. It Those of us who are health, who are rich in health, we should wear masks to help them. Regardless of where I never wanted to wear it, I hated the thing, but I wore it because I wanted to help them. That to me, it seemed as if I was doing something out of an act of love rather than tolerance. So while that's a very simple example, I think you can do similar things with art. And I think that's partly what Dada was doing uh, um, in their critiques. They saw things that were happening in the language of journalists, in government official, in religious leaders. 
and they saw that it was corrupted. Um, and so as a result of that, they were creating uh, um, anti-art, if you will, in order to draw attention to that. Uh, of course, that assumes that you can identify what's corruption and how do we do that? I think this gets us back into our conversation yesterday. This is why we study the tradition. This is why we live in community with other believers. This is why we study the scriptures because it's within the life, death, resurrection of Jesus that helps us understand those things that are true, those things that are good, those things that are just. Um, he becomes, uh, as uh, they say, the one to whom we refer to our understanding on helping us gain an understanding of that. That's why I mentioned the prophets. Look at Amos. Amos, sharp critique on people of the day and how they were treating the poor. Complete neglect of the poor. Uh, and as a prophet, uh, God wasn't real happy with them. <laughs> so. So another thought uh, rose to me, uh, because you said that, um, uh, well, um, yeah, the critique is good. And I, I agree with that, that we should uh, aim to, to talk about the things that, uh, war that are worrying to us and that um, um, we should be brave to do that, uh, especially connected to the church. But um, when there's, uh, I think, uh, every uh, Christian person that has this his inner wish to spread the, the uh, I mean, to evangelize essentially, mm -hmm. and um, and for example, me for example, I've I've encountered this uh, dilemma of um, how how should I do that um, because I I have this wish, you know. But um, uh, we wouldn't that um, wouldn't my choice to maybe speak about the the church and um, the problems within it and maybe taking this drastic and this brave stance of expressing my opinion for the greater good, of course, wouldn't it uh, further not rebuke but you know further distance the people that are uh, um, already doubting and maybe we should we shouldn't from that point of wanting to evangelize maybe it isn't logical to critique maybe it's more logical to you know spread the good news only and yeah, yeah. so that's why i said earlier uh, great uh, thoughts uh challenging thoughts um so also partly why i said i didn't want to prescribe one way um because i think not only um is you know individual uh, uh is important there but it's also the context and the cultural culturally sensitive um to your own culture um as to how people may respond this that and the other to you know to that so even so even that's where i think i would agree with maritime here in making good work uh, and doing good work i mean i i i think when we when we do that and people see that we're striving for excellence that we're trying to do good things uh and that they see and, and then the product comes out as something that's uh, that's impressive these sorts of things uh, can help create important in what you're saying is relationships. So, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, within some of the conservative sides of the American church here, um, you know, sometimes that might get lost. Uh, many just think, oh, just go share this pamphlet with them or just go tell them about the gospel. If they don't like it, that's their problem, you know, and I'm not so sure that's uh, very productive, very helpful. Um, I actually think it's it's better with relationships. Um, and so your art, how do you bring that in? How do you bring the good news? Uh, and so, you know, the gospel, I think, is powerful in this sense that uh, um, it does bring us hope. But it also recognizes, too, um, that it deals with death. <laughs> I mean, and so we, you know, it, you know, the, the glory of Christ came through his suffering. 
Um, and it ultimately helped us see the hope only because of the resurrection. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, if the resurrection didn't happen or if it's not real, then all these things we believe in is a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> and so as a result of that, you know, I think that's why we can, can speak hopefully. Um, and how you communicate that as an artist um, you know, that's something that, you know, is probably the challenge, right? How do you do that through various materiality that you're using? Um, and I think it comes um, by being a part of a community, uh, this nurturing this disposition, nurturing your faith, reading, talking, praying, um, participating in the liturgy, all these sorts of things. And yet at the same time, doing your best to create the best art that you can. Learning from, you know, uh, 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 those who've had more experience than you and your craft and having them teach you and school you and educate you and help you learn how to, to do. The, and then trying things yourself. I think putting all of that together, like we said yesterday, um, is, is a, a way forward. Thank you. Um, does anyone have anything to add to that? Okay. Um, if no, I have one more question. Yeah. So um, I maybe would like to hear your opinion on the approach to, um, to maybe spread the gospel, um, but intentionally hide it under the maybe the media or something and um, because i see a conflict here when you know we want you want and you need your work and your art to be as um, as honest as possible and with all your heart you want to you know speak truthfully and openly about everything but well uh, we've had discussions with um, in, in the club maybe maybe not maybe not to be so blunt to people mm -hmm. when we want to so what what do you think of that don't you think it's mm -hmm. it's uh, controversial maybe i don't know um i don't think it's controversial necessarily um you know i i think uh, you know, when we, uh, when we, uh, the way I, this is, this is the way that, you know, I, I look at it. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, the role that, uh, you know, my faith plays um, in, um, you know, my own work and my own life, uh, even, you know, there uh, at, um, at the Art Academy while I was there, you know, I think about it um, in, maybe this will help you uh, in bringing things into the foreground and into the background, right? So if, like Maritan says, you know, don't try to split this Christian side of you and your art side of you, everything is together as one. So the question then is, when do we bring the art side into view? Um, when does that stay in the background? When do we bring the Christian part of us uh, uh, um, into view? And when does it stay in the background? And I think that those questions can only be answered by the guidance uh, on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to know when to bring these into conversations or into our art and when not to bring it into our art. Um, and so, but yet it's important to know that it's still connected. Think about Baal and what Baal was doing and all that he read, even from, you know, Hildegard, but uh, the things, you know, of his own thoughts from his Catholic upbringing, um, that these things were bleeding into the foreground at times, but they seemed nonsensical. And yet when he took time to write and think about them in his own diaries and journals, he, the, he was recognizing the connections between his habitus, his dispositions, the way in which he was shaped and formed and how they were informing the work he was doing. And yet they weren't very uh, uh, much in the front, right? And so 
a, another way to, to talk about this in, in visual art terms, uh, you might be familiar with the idea of asymmetrical balance. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with this or not. Uh, let me show you um, one. This is a very famous work. Everybody knows this work, Van Gogh's Starry Night. Um, this particular uh, is an example of asymmetrical balance, right? So in terms of symmetry, you can't uh, simply, uh, um, you know, split this particular uh, artwork down the middle and you have, you know, balance on the left and the right. You can't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, split it uh, horizontally um, and you have balance on the top and the bottom. You just, you, you, because what you have here is asymmetry. You have the tree that's in the foreground um, and yet what do you have in the background? You have, you know, the stars and the moon off in the right-hand corner. You have the, the tree in the foreground um, that is up front and center. And yet look at the church. The church is in the center of the painting, and yet it has the same sort of length uh, um, and height, but it's at a distance. It's in, it's in the background, right? And yet it's the same sort of, what is the tree helping us do? The tree is pointing us into, you know, the heavens. The tree, just like a steeple, is leading us uh, to look and ponder the starry night and the beauty we see uh, um, in creation itself. Um, and so, you know, and yet it doesn't have the same sort of symmetry. It has asymmetrical balance. And so to me, this is a, a good example of how we can bring our faith into uh, um, our life and our in our artwork is through asymmetrical balance. It's never the churches you see in this is never going away. It's always going to be there. And yet at times, you know, it needs to be in the background. And yet the tree itself, the artwork you make that points you to those things that are greater than the work itself. This is what Maritain was saying about beauty pointing us something to beyond into the depths. And that's what artists, uh, he says, are doing or trying to find and discover and, and, and participate and, and be a part of that deeper sense of reality. Then this leads us into point as the tree does to something greater than ourselves. And yet you see the balance because of the church in the background, you know, that has the same sort of pointing as the steeple does to the sky with you know the moon on the right hand side uh, pointing us or, or providing the balance from right to left. Um, so that's an example. There are others. Maybe that helps you uh, to think about you know how that might take place personally in your own life. This sort of foregrounding and backgrounding. When do you do this? I don't know. <laughs> There's no formula. For this, it's uh, being you know in conversations with your uh, you know other you know believers. It's also being in conversation with the spirit and with with God in how and when and why to do this. It's a journey. It's a journey. Will you get it right all the time? No. <laughs> will you mess it up and you offend some people? Probably. <laughs> Um, will you not represent it as well as you would have liked to? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's the life, you know. It's a really great answer. Thank you. It has brought much clarity, actually. So good. good. So uh, any other yeah questions, thoughts? Any other any other questions? We have one question, but um, I think it's for the end. So I'm not sure if that's the right time or not yet. <laughs> I think it, it may be yeah, the, the right time because yeah, you can. Or maybe before that, I would like to ask one question just by, by myself. So uh, during your uh, lecture, I was thinking about another movement, about fluxus movement, because here in Lithuania, we have heard quite a lot of about them because both Jurgis Machunas and Jonas Makas were one of the most famous um, representatives of Luxus and they were both Lithuanians. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about their connections with Dada, uh, but um, in that background, in, in that 
basement uh, our our fluxus uh, is uh, was fluxus very very different from that uh, or mm -hmm. maybe are there any possibilities to see any christian insights in their actions as well you know i don't know because i don't know that movement very well um you know it sounds like a really good research project for you <laughs> and so <laughs> it might be something for you to explore maybe perhaps things that i mean tell me more about uh you know uh, i don't know much you know about that so it could be something that you know would be interesting to to look into so and maybe with the way in which you know we we're looking at data here so data in this case you know so maritime you know um you know talks about that habitus and as we dug into the habitus of bow right that's what we were doing so that's what I was doing. I wasn't just looking at uh, um, the the work that was produced. That's what sometimes we we look at this work that's produced. Uh, um, this is all we consider. But instead, looking into the habitus of Baal and, and what was informing his work and how it was shaping his work, that's where we dug into. Similarly, perhaps a similar approach as an art historian to look into those aspects. What do you see? What were those that influenced uh, um, the shaping and making of the work itself? Maybe that's a way forward to look into that, that movement. Um, and maybe you'll find parallels. Maybe you'll find um connections well usually they are not connected with religious themes they are more like um understood more like a protest against uh, the um, society like also materialistic society but 1960s 1970s uh, mainly yeah. so but, here's here's yeah so if in that case Whenever there's protests, there's always an assumption of what is the right thing to do or the right person to be. So that's the things that I would be looking for. There is something that they are uh, um, disgusted with in the culture. So why? And it's assumed uh, uh, usually about the views of the human person. How is it that society is uh, uh, denigrating that through materialist culture? Uh, um, for example, as you know, this you remember uh, Gross's uh, a mechanical head. This was a great example of how, you know, in the, even in its subtitle, The Spirit of Our Age, this was a great example of is this asking the question what it means to be human is this what our mechanistic industrialized warfare is teaching us about what it means to be human so how did he come to this critique similarly i think you can ask those same kinds of questions so whenever there's protest whenever there's critique there are assumptions about a whole host of things but but usually about the human person there are assumptions about god um, with you know belief or non-belief, okay, but those theological assumptions are still there. They may be buried, buried, buried deep, but they're still there. And the same thing uh, about you know the world itself. Is the world itself simply closed off, as we talked about yesterday, as imminent frame? It's only material, only what we see, feel. Is that all the world is, or is there something that's transcendent about the world, right? and a sense of enchantment that we hear Baal talking about today um, because of the nature of language, right? Um, and the connections he made between language um, and the treatment of human persons. So that's what I would, you know, would to, to try to get behind um, in understanding of then that habitus to asking those kinds of questions. Um, as I said, any protest, always an assumption of something that um, is ideal or better uh, um, um, than what is being protested against. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, maybe then the last question from our chaplain, Davidas. 
Uh, he's a chaplain of uh, Vilnius Academy of Arts and uh, the Lithuanian Academy of Theater and Music. And um, he would like to ask you, what could you wish for our club and especially for a young um, artist who is also, uh, who has a religion in his heart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you for that question. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, Bobby, this I is think, way wing for us. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, of course, for your club, I'm very excited that you, uh, you know, are in existence. Uh, and, and I have, you know, I think uh, um, when uh, Godrma and I were talking about early on, uh, she told me a bit about your history and how you started. And it would began right uh, um, after I left. <clears throat> and so um, I know there was another um, group, uh, you might be familiar with uh, another Christian group, Agape. Um, they had some people who were, that they were uh, student-wise, that they were trying to start a group, but it never materialized. Um, and so I'm thrilled first to hear that you just exist. Um, why? Because these sorts of questions aren't often discussed within the academy. And yet, um, as human beings, we all have religious sensibilities, whether Christian, uh, how we understand these sensibilities, uh, um, as human beings, we have them. So to close that part of the conversation off um, and not allow that conversation to occur um, is making us less human. <laughs> So in this respect, the, what St. Luke's Club is about, and I appreciate the invitations, is open to all. It's not just simply for Catholics, it's not for Protestants, it's not for Orthodox, uh, it's for, for everyone who wants to explore questions that are related to these religious sensibilities. Um, so I just encourage you to continue, uh, continue to meet, uh, continue to uh, encourage one another, uh, continue to wrestle with these questions. Uh, um, and yeah, and thrilled, of course, that uh, Yeva is, uh, has the Art Academy. Um, I don't know about the drama side of things, but the Art Academy, you know, is, is also very much a part. So as for young artists, um, I think we've said very, you know, several things um, throughout the last couple of days. Uh, but as a Christian artist, I think just remember that, you know, um, you're not alone. You're not a genius uh, by yourself. You're doing this in community with others. Uh, focus on doing good work. Um, focus on nurturing your faith um, with others in the church. Um, they're not separate. They're together. Uh, like Maritan said, it's a part of his integral humanism. We have many parts of us, but none of these parts are more important the, than other uh, than the other, and we're all one. We're all one person, um, and so when you bring these things together as a young artist, uh, you know it helps you to remain humble, um, and I think that's an important mark of Christianity. Um, is that we're you know as as Jesus did, he humbled himself to become like one of us. He was the God of the universe, and yet he came like one of us um, so that we can have life and hope. And as Christian, young Christian artists, um, yeah, bring life, bring hope uh, into a world that uh, is looking for it, um, desperately looking for it. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, for Kunigas uh, Davidas for asking this question. It's, it's very, very dear to me. So yeah, so it seems that we've come to an end of uh, both of our lectures. So thanks everyone for participating and especially professor, thank you for taking the time to give us this wisdom. And um, yeah, I think um, even if we haven't found uh, yet what we bring out of this, we will definitely find later. And um, because uh, the, uh, the lectures have been recorded, so we will upload them to our YouTube page, our club's YouTube page. So everyone will be able to find them there. So yeah, thanks again.
So again, yes, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's brought back a lot of great memories. You know, um, I, uh, I, of course, will show everybody else the same thing that I showed Derute, you and Godrume. Uh, because it has, uh, you know, great meaning for me. So, you know, uh, you remember, of course, this is Nida, Nida. Uh, has great memories for my family and for myself, uh, of course, there at the art colony uh, and the time spent there. And so, yeah, it was great uh, uh, to be with you again. And I, I've shared my email in the chat. Um, feel free to email me. Uh, you have questions or, you know, we can set up uh, even, you know, a, a Zoom time to talk more. Um, of course, very interested to keep up with St. Luke's Club. Tell me about, you know, if you have a newsletter uh, or something like that, of course, on Facebook, I'm following you. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Mm -hmm. So have a good night, everyone. And yeah, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. See you. See you.